Why did some Irish take over a post office in Dublin in Easter 1916? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello and welcome to this episode of Footnoting History. I'm Elizabeth and with me is Christine. Hello. You may remember us from such episodes as Royal Baby Names, Parts 1 and 2. But today, we're leaving our monarchical tendencies behind, and instead, we'll be discussing the events leading up to the Easter Rising, as well as some of the major figures in the rebellion. I, for one, am very excited about this topic, because it was one of the first things I covered when I was in college, and it made me fall in love with Irish history. So much so, I'm going to Ireland for this, and it's going to be amazing. I'm so jealous. Sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. I'm just, I'm really jealous. And as good lovers of all things Irish, even the food, I know, we, we actually will eat the food. It's true. With 100th anniversary of the Easter Rising this year, Christine and I knew we had to devote one, if not two, episodes to this topic. But I need to let you know two things that happened in the development <laughs> of these episodes. And I'm going to try not to become hysterical because it was pretty Truman Show over here for a while. So first, in my original podcast script, Christine and, or for our scripts, Christine and I divvied up the parts into one and two. She was going to describe the aftermath, and I was going to do the lead up and some of the main figures. I included seven pages of the history of Irish-British relations from the Tudor period, with an extremely heavy emphasis on the 19th century, and then two pages on the rising. Christine, ever the diplomat, said that it was great and so educational, and she loved how much material I fit in, but could we actually talk about the rising? This is true. Very true. I felt very bad about it. I was like, what? You don't like my seven pages on land fights in the 19th century? I don't know. What? What? But after much thought and heartache, but actually, no, really, after realizing what she said made a lot of sense, I agreed. And Christine has promised me that in the future, we're going to do an episode on the 19th century. So be on the lookout, although it probably won't be until 2017 because 2016 is actually laid out. But it's going to be good anyway, because I like that topic too. Oh, it's going to rock. But what I also have to tell you is... These podcasts are on the Easter Rising. When Christine read my script, she was like, hey, cool and all, but you keep calling it the Easter Uprising. And I said, yeah, that's, it's the Easter Uprising. I've been studying this thing for 20 years. I've written papers on it. I've submitted papers on it. Like, I've got tons of books on this topic. What are you talking about? And she's like, but it's the Easter Rising. I'm like, I have no idea what you're, t what? So I, I did what everyone would do. I immediately went to Google to prove my case. I googled Easter Uprising, and what returned to me was a Wikipedia article called Easter Rising. I kid you not, I'm actually still having a really hard time processing this. I went and looked through my past papers, and I called it Easter Uprising the entire- No one has ever corrected me. Christine is the first one who has said no. I, I brought the hammer down, sorry. <laughs> I am like, it is like a kaleidoscope in my head. It's a Truman Show <laughs> moment. I don't really know what's happening. So I've changed it to Easter Rising, but you're going to hear me stutter throughout this entire, <laughs> the entire two episodes because I, I can't. I'm wrong all the time. So there we are. But these, so this episode is perhaps the hardest thing I've ever had to write because not only did I have to cut all of my context, but I wasn't even saying the name correctly. And my mind is blown. Okay, so let's dive in because we've, we've, we do have a lot to cover. And I'm going to start with the later Middle Ages. I know you're all like, what? No, you just said you're leaving that out. No, we're going to, I gave you a couple of sentences. All right. So since the later Middle Ages, Englishmen had been living in and ruling parts of Ireland. Over the centuries, their power only spread. Technically, the relationship between Britain and Ireland during this period was known as a personal union, meaning they had the same monarch but different boundaries and laws. In 1798, inspired by the Americans and French Revolution, Irish nationals rebelled against their British rulers and lost. In response, in 1800, Ireland officially became part of Great Britain through the Act of Union. On the ground in Ireland, though, the landed gentry controlled the Protestant minority and the Catholic majority, and this was true for much of the 19th century, including, of course, the infamous famine, which we will discuss in greater detail in our 19th century Ireland podcast that's going to happen. 
Yes, very much detail. Seriously, I cut a lot of pages. But for now, what we're going to say is that while the famine had worse effects on some, like laborers and subtenant farmers, regardless of whom was hurt more in the famine, what it did was increase sympathy for the Irish tenants, especially in other countries and regions where many Irish emigrated during and following the famine. Including the U.S. Potentially a lot of our listeners might be able to trace their lineage there. But how did we get from the famine to the Easter Rising? During the last quarter of the 19th century, nationalist groups like the Gaelic League began to gain traction throughout Ireland. And why not? Nationalism was, was everywhere at this period in time. Leaders of the National Land League tried to persuade clergy that their political violence was actually moral retribution against the pagan conquerors. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there were some attempts for appeasement by the British to the Irish. The British Prime Minister, Gladstone, however, was accused of taking on a Celtic flavor by his adversaries, especially after he tried to pass a Home Rule Bill in 1886. A Home Rule Bill is exactly what it sounds like. The Irish were to remain part of the British Empire, but govern themselves. This was actually one of the goals of many of the nationalist movements, of many of the Irish nationalist movements. If they couldn't have complete independence, some would settle for Home Rule. Unfortunately, the bill failed, most likely because the desire for Irish nationalism lost out to British nationalism in Parliament. After all, this was the heyday of the British Empire and imperialism. The British were not about to give up one of the countries just as they were getting others under control. Within Ireland, Catholics and Protestants found that they had fewer and fewer issues in common anymore. Most Protestants, especially those from Ulster in the north, along with their Presbyterian neighbors, voted Tory, and this, in conjunction with their orange values, caused them to adopt unionism, meaning they wanted to remain unified with Great Britain. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, on the other hand, attracted Catholics who fervently wanted Irish sovereignty. This rise in nationalism coincided with, or perhaps helped cause, the Irish literary radical movement and the Gaelic revival that began in 1891. Remember that when we discuss some of our leading figures in a few moments. There were some attempts to pacify the desires for Irish nationalism in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, but none were deemed acceptable by either the Unionists or the Republicanists. Is that a word, the Republicanists? We're going to go with that. Those in support of a free Ireland. Technically, one could point to the gains the Irish, especially the Irish Catholics, had made since the 1860s. Again, really, this is where the episode on 19th century Ireland will fill in some blanks, I promise you. But by the turn of the 20th century, it seems there was no going back. Many Irish still wanted home rule. Political groups such as the Ancient Order of Hibernians, fun fact, once went on a ski trip organized by the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Anyway, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the United Irish League, and after 1907, labor unions even began to cause new agitation or ferment the old. Home rule had become the issue in Ireland. While Irish Catholics wanted a home rule under Catholics, Protestant Irish, especially those from Ulster, were Unionists who considered home rule to be the equivalent of Rome rule. The Unionists blamed the King's death in May of 1910 on pandering to the Irish by the Liberal members of Parliament. Changes in Parliament at this time, however, led the members to believe that the time for appeasement was done. Compromise would be the goal. John Redmond, an Irish nationalist politician, member of Parliament, and namesake of one of Liz's cousins, worked hard to get a home rule bill passed. He compromised on what to do with the six northern counties, Ulster, and he compromised on when home rule would be implemented. But eventually, he managed to get it passed in September of 1914. And of course, we all know what had happened in August of 1914. Yes, home rule was put on the back burner as the British were thrust into a world war, a war to end all wars. By April of 1916, 150,000 Irish were on active service in World War I, and two-thirds of them had been involved since the war had broken out. A small group of men from the Irish Republican Brotherhood decided to take advantage of the situation, namely the war, and as early as September 1914, when that Home Rule Bill was passed, members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood had agreed that before the war ended, there would be a revolt, and they would take the Germans' help to carry it out. In 1913, Irish Catholics had created the Irish Volunteers, a parrot military group, and they had created it in response to the Ulster Volunteer Force, a paramilitary Protestant group. 
The Irish Volunteers and Irish Republican Brotherhood overlapped in many members, and the groups are largely responsible for the Rising. Okay, so who are some of the major figures of the Easter Rising and what were their plans? We are going to talk about Patrick Pierce, Tom Clark, Roger Casement, Joseph Plunkett, and James Connolly. I'm excited. Sorry. I love this. <laughs> Since there were seven leaders and we're only going in depth on five, we want to apologize in advance if we skipped your favorite. Feel free to comment about it, tweet us, Facebook, the website, whatnot. But before we get into Patrick Pierce, I want to remind you that Christine and I each did our own research and write up separately. Me for part one, Christine for part two. And now, by the way, you really know who to blame for everything. In all, so for our part one notes, I spelled Patrick, P-A-D-R-A-I-C. And I spelled it Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-C-K, which came not from not knowing how Patrick Pierce would have wanted his name spelled, but because I use the anglicized spelling for everything. This is the reason. It's not that I don't respect Irish history, because I love Irish history. My ancestors are Irish. It's because when I'm recording a podcast, I have a crippling fear of mispronouncing somebody's name. So if there are two versions of it, sometimes, yes, I will take the anglicized version so that I don't risk sounding completely stupid by saying the original version incorrectly. But I promise I don't mean any disrespect by it. Do you remember when we did the New Zealand podcast and we, I, I like literally went on social media and asked people how to pronounce various names? Yes, because we want to get it right. So I also considered it spelling it P-A-D-R-A-I-G, but I'm not, I'm going to admit that the reason I actually went Patrick, so Christine went Patrick, I went Padrick, P-A-D-R-A-I-C, because one of my brothers is actually named Patrick Pierce, spelled P-A-D-R-A-I-C. Yes, that's right. I come from a family where not only do we have a Redmond, but we have a Patrick Pierce. My entire childhood, people thought that we were mispronouncing my brother's name, and it was really Patrick. And no, it is Patrick. Wow, this podcast is really bringing out a lot of personal anecdotes on my, my part. That's okay. We're going to go back to Pierce, okay? He was born in Dublin in 1879. He was only 36 in 1916, but in that short period of time, he was already an accomplished poet, a teacher, and, as we know him, a nationalist leader. Side point, the school where he used to teach is now a museum, and I can't wait to go to it, so... I can't wait to see your pictures. I was going to say, I'm going to be posting pictures through our Facebook account of all of my little Irish journeys at the end of April. Anyhow... Pierce was afraid that his countrymen had, quote, conceived of nationality as a material thing, whereas it is a spiritual thing, end quote. And he, along with the other writers, desired to infuse the rebellion the Irish Republican Brotherhood was planning with ideological content. He and others in the Irish Republican Brotherhood believed nationhood would be achieved through blood sacrifice. The writings of Pierce and others in the movement, including two more members of the uprising, McDonough and Plunkett, were infused with Catholic mysticism and had decidedly messianic strains. They focused on the symbol of the rose, which is the flower of the Rosicrucians, a symbol of Christ and the symbol for the Irish nation. They combined pagan and Christian lore by fusing the legend of Cúchulainn, a mythic hero who died defending Ireland from invaders, with the life of Christ. The Fianna, the Irish Boy Scout, was based on the Cúchulainn idea of youth, enlisted in the service of the nation, and trained to die, if need be, for the nation. Historian Tom Garvin argues that the Irish hearkened back to their Gaelic past because relatively little was known about it, and, quote, they could ascribe any virtues to it that they fancied, end quote. But that's Patrick, the mystical figurehead. Tom Clark, another member of the group, was actually the strategist behind the plans. Clark, who was 58 at the time of the Rising, had the credentials to plan the rebellion. Clark had joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood at 20, was sent to London to blow up London Bridge at 25, failed, was imprisoned for 15 years, and, upon release, moved to Brooklyn, New York, and got married. What a lovely immigrant story. He returned to Ireland in 1907. Clark refused to join the Irish Volunteers when they were formed in 1913 because he knew he was already on the British radar, but he kept an eye on developments, especially Redmond's Home Rule Bill. He became the treasurer of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and in 1915 began planning the Rising. I know that Patrick Pierce is seen as a symbol of the Easter Rising, but to me, Tom Clark's the lifelong rebel in the story. 
He devotes his entire adult life to fighting for a free Ireland. And Roger Casement, our next rising figure, spent his entire life devoted to revealing and drawing attention to human rights abuses. Casement was even knighted in 1911 for his reports on human rights abuses in Peru. Casement, from an Anglo-Irish family in Dublin, strongly rejected imperialism. He also didn't believe that home rule could be achieved through parliamentary legislation. As a member of the Gaelic League, he was drawn to the new political organization Sinn Féin, which propagated the idea that nonviolent strikes and boycotts could lead to Irish independence. It was not until the summer of 1913, however, that Caseman retired from the British Consular Service. That's right, he worked for the British Council. Within a few short months, he was helping to create the Irish Volunteers, and as soon as war broke out in August 1914, and I literally mean as soon as war broke out. In August 1914, Caseman traveled to Germany to make a deal. If the Germans would supply guns and military leaders, the Irish would revolt and draw Britain's attention away from the war effort. Caseman's work wasn't just limited to Ireland, though. He also tried to work out a deal between India and the Germans, because at his core, Caseman opposed imperialism in the British Empire. If Pierce is the mystical leader for a free Ireland, and Clark the strategic brains to create that free Ireland, Casement, for me, is the shadowy figure who played both sides, but also saw the larger picture. It wasn't enough for him that Ireland should be free. All of the empire had to be free. I kind of always felt a little bit bad for Casement. I know. I mean, I, I don't want to jump on you telling the end of his story, though, so you keep going and I'll insert it at the end. Casement, however, was caught by the British three days before the Rising. The Germans had returned him via submarine early because the Germans did not really live up to a lot of the bargain. They didn't give us military leaders. <laughs> I just said us, because I'm apparently one of them. There was okay. miscommunication. There was. There was miscommunication. There weren't, I was about to say us again. They didn't give us military leaders. They didn't give us enough guns. Unfortunately, Caseman had suffered from malaria off and on for years, and he had a recurrence of the disease just as he was literally thrown off a submarine into Ireland, and the British found him too weak to travel. They ended up trying him for treason, although there was a big argument on whether or not it could be treason because the deal was made in Germany and not within the British Isles themselves. And the Brits even circulated entries from his diary to show that he was a homosexual and thereby ruin any sympathy anyone might have for him. And it may or may not have actually been his diary. Nothing was said explicitly that you can say either way what he even meant. So he was found guilty, and even though supporters like Arthur Conan Doyle, that's right, the man who wrote Sherlock Holmes, argued for clemency, Caseman was executed in August 1916. But the reason I feel bad for him is because he disappointed the British by serving for them and then going to help the Irish turn against them. And then he, not intentionally, but still, let down the people from the Rising by getting arrested instead of coming to help them. So he kind of had good intentions, but no good was going to come from it. But still, I've always felt kind of bad that all of his plans kind of went awry. Fun fact, he converted to Catholicism right before they executed him. That's a fun fact, just to kind of throw out there at a party. There anyway, Joseph Plunkett, one of my favorites, and I'm very glad that I get to talk about him because I just like him. So Joseph Plunkett was one of the youngest of the uprising. He was 28 in 1916, born to a wealthy Irish Catholic family. As a child, he contracted tuberculosis. His mother brought him to many spots to help improve his health, but it didn't work. From a young age, Plunkett embraced the Gaelic League and all of its mysticism. He joined the Irish Volunteers, then the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and it was he who was sent to join Casement in Germany to help gain the much-needed support. Unfortunately for Plunkett, he had an attack of bad health before the Rising and actually had surgery just a few days before the events took place. He dragged himself out of the hospital, still bandaged and bleeding, to participate. His assistant was a young man named Michael Collins. That might ring a bell. Plunkett, as we'll go into more detail next week, became one of the more romantic figures of the Rising because of what he did afterwards. Okay, and finally, last but not least... James Connolly. And okay, I have no reason to view him like this, but in my head, Connolly is the Donald Duck of the Rising. He's irascible. He was older, 47 in 1916. He had been raised in Scotland, so perhaps I should see him more like Uncle Scrooge because he never actually lost his Scottish accent. 
And that would actually be pretty funny because Connolly was an avowed Marxist. He's also the leader of the Irish Socialist Movement and the Irish Citizens Army. And even though he believed that, quote, socialism transcended religious differences, end quote, he was deeply involved with the nationalistic rising because, as he told his daughter, first and foremost, quote, I am an Irishman, end quote. And I find that statement very telling. Culture, nation, above all, even for a man raised in Scotland his entire life. Yes, and I think that Pierce, Clark, and Plunkett would have agreed strongly with his sentiment, even if maybe they weren't socialists, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were all Irishmen. Casement, I think, more empire, but the rest of them, Irishmen to the end. Connolly and his citizens' army, who were actually planning their own rebellion, joined with the Irish Republican Brotherhood group in January of 1916. And that, my friends, is how we have finally found ourselves at the General Post Office on that fateful day. The plan was simple. Guns and ammunitions were to arrive from the Germans the night before Easter Sunday, and then the leaders, such as Pierce and Connolly, along with some of their followers, were to seize key buildings in Dublin. Men throughout the countryside were also supposed to rise up and join the fray. But it all went pear-shaped rather quickly. The guns from the Germans were seized by the British three days before, but the rebellion, even though a day late, otherwise went ahead as planned. On Easter Monday, 1,200 members of the Irish Volunteers and Citizens Army took over several places in Dublin, including the General Post Office, which was considered the rebel headquarters. Okay, I have a personal anecdote. Oh, please do tell us. <laughs> I know, this entire podcast episode is... Let me tell you how this all relates to Elizabeth's life. Not only do I have a brother named Patrick Pierce and a cousin named Redmond, but one day in grade school, I came home from school, my Catholic school, in eighth grade and told my mom that our teacher had told us that the Irish colluded with the Germans during World War I because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Okay, my mother's wrath did not match that of when I told her that I had read a book from the same Catholic school's library. I had read a book sympathetic to the Rosenbergs, and the whole Cold War spy thing, but she was not pleased and said that schools should not be teaching such malicious slander of the Irish. Uh, good, good times in the Cohane household that day. On April 24th, 1916, the leaders of the Rising read aloud the proclamation of the Irish Republic, and they declared that, quote, she strikes in full confidence of victory, end quote, and referred to the English as, quote, foreign people, end quote. I actually have a copy of this hanging on my bedroom wall. Fun side fact. Anyway, the uprising has been seen as comparable to the 19th century European uprisings, or as an intentional action to create martyrs for the nationalistic movement. Either way, though at first it was regarded as stupidity and lunacy by the majority of the Irish, no one saw it as illegal. The British, as we shall explain in our next episode, did not agree. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>